it's just not possible to gain that much in value that quickly with declining revenue. And that's when I really had the epiphany that investing was not about stocks and bonds. Investing is about innovation. The belief is if there's a new piece of information, that it will be instantly incorporated into the price of the stock or the bond or whatever. But that's not how people change their minds. Welcome back. I'm Hayden Brain, and you're listening to Opto Sessions, where we interview the top traders and investors from around the world, uncovering their secrets to success. Guy Ellison is the head of UK equity research at Investec, a wealth manager and investment bank responsible for £41.7 billion of client assets. Guy is responsible for Investec's coverage of UK equities, focusing on the travel and leisure, support services, aerospace and defence, utilities and beverages sectors. We discuss Investec's research process and how the team identifies quality growth stocks. Guy discusses UK equity valuations, comparing UK value to US and European markets. And I finish by asking Guy for his 2022 outlook for the FTSE 100. Enjoy. Welcome, Guy. It's great to have you on the show. The US stock market is up over, I checked this yesterday, around 213% over the past 10 years. So while UK and European investors can't boast the same returns, equity bulls in general have fared relatively well over the past decade. I think that would be relatively fair to say. But, you know, from your perspective as an equity researcher, can you safely say, and I, I want to avoid explicit predictions at this point, but can you safely say, or should investors reasonably expect similar performance over the next 10 years or so? Oh, that's a good question to start with. I think it would be very ambitious to expect anything like the same level of returns for the next 10 years, though, of course, we'd be delighted to be proved wrong. Uh, the last decade has been an exceptional one, really, in terms of the looseness of monetary policy. We've had very low interest rates around the world, compounded by concerted quantitative easing from the world's major central banks. And this provided a very fertile backdrop for corporates and equity investors, helped by consistent, if unspectacular, economic growth and, and very low borrowing costs and ample liquidity that drove the valuation of most liquid asset classes higher. However, looking forwards, uh, the current backdrop of very high inflation, um, that party of easy liquidity has now come to an end, rates are rising, monetary stimulus is being withdrawn, and economic growth is slowing just as bond yields are rising. We'd expect this to provide a headwind for equity investors over the next 12 to 18 months and and probably means uh, we shouldn't be expecting such a golden decade as we've enjoyed over the last 10 years. Yeah, fantastic. And a great overview. But then if we take UK equity markets in particular, you know, uh, Investec have got a slight slant or bias towards those historically. So uh, I'm keen throughout the interview to focus on UK equities. Uh, How does that narrative differ if if it differs at all? Yeah, I think there's a distinction to be made for our domestic uh, UK stock market, uh, starting from this juncture. Uh, you're dead right that whilst our focus today is on global equities at Investec, uh, as a consequence of our history, we still have a skew to the domestic UK market. And as it happens, after a decade of underperformance of its international peer group, uh, the medium term potential for the UK market is starting to look uh, more favourable compared to those peers. In part, that's due to the very healthy starting dividend yield on the UK market, just shy of a 4% forward dividend yield for the FTSE All Share. Uh, That compares to a 1.5% return for the S&P 500. Uh, But it also reflects the more cyclical elements of the UK market. Uh, Between them, the oil majors and the mining companies in the UK are nearly 20% uh, of the FTSE All Share, uh, and at the moment are enjoying super normal profits and cash flows as a consequence of very firm commodity prices. So it seems, uh, at least for the near term, uh, that the tailwinds are more supportive of the UK market than they have been for many years. Yeah, fantastic. And I think there's a few themes that I want to return to further on in the conversation. But if we can just sort of circle back and cover your current role at Investor, your head of UK equities there, can you talk to us about what a typical day, if such a thing exists, looks like for you at the moment? Yes, of course. Uh, I'm part of a team of 10 people within Investec Wealth who are tasked with conducting direct equity research. So the day job is quite simple, to identify the best-in-class opportunities in each sector on a global basis, uh, to allow our investment managers to create portfolios for clients that offer superior returns. I'd say a typical day really depends on where we are in the annual reporting cycle. Uh, Whilst we try not to get too tied up in short-term quarterly reporting, it's often quite difficult not to get drawn into the noise that this produces in the market. 
And currently, you know, as we speak, we're at the peak of the first quarter reporting cycle, which unfortunately coincides with the peak of the annual general meeting cycle as well, <laughs> uh, which means that we're doubly busy really analyzing the most recent results and updates uh, from the companies that we're invested in, uh, but also forming an opinion of how we should be exercising our stewardship responsibilities for our clients and voting at company meetings. Outside of this peak period, uh, we have more time to update our research uh, and think a little bit more broadly about the opportunity set uh, that we have at our disposal. But alongside you know, the, the research part of the day job, uh, we don't just sit in an ivory tower and produce recommendations for our investment managers. We work alongside them day to day and spend a good amount of time interacting with them uh, through topics such as ad hoc questions and queries uh, to more formal engagement with clients and intermediaries. Yeah, fantastic. I, I wanted to dig into those recommendations just because I guess re there'll be a lot of retail investors in, some intermediaries and institutional as well. But for people that are unfamiliar with a role like this, what exactly goes into a recommendation? Because I mean, from, from my perspective, I certainly imagine it to be more than just a stock pick, for example. You know, what factors, what bits of information go into that recommendation? Yeah, it's a very good question. And it's an evolving a uh, list of inputs, really, that go into any decision. Yeah, once upon a time, if we rolled back a decade, uh, our focus as analysts would very much have been on identifying those companies with the best business fundamentals and the greatest uh, long-term potential for growth. And that is still a very important part of what we do. That's why we're investing in equities. Uh, but alongside that now, we have to take full consideration uh, of the sustainability of those investments mm. as well. So you, your audience might be more familiar with it in terms of the ESG credentials uh, of a company. You know, that is now an inseparable part of our analysis. It's no good identifying a, a most fantastic long-term opportunity uh, if it is not properly managing the risks and responsibilities that it has to society, to the planet, to its customers, and to its shareholders from an ESG point of view. Yeah, fantastic. And time horizon wise, are we looking longer term or does that differ from recommendation to, to recommendation? Our starting point is a longer term recommendation. So we would term that anything greater than 18 months. Yeah, we are quite a large business. We have a, a large number of individual clients, uh, all of whose mandates are managed on a bespoke basis. It means that we couldn't be, even if we wanted to be, uh, the most agile mover in the market. Mm. But no, we're looking for businesses that we can buy and hopefully we can hold forever. If we get it right, we've picked the the kind of industries that that kick uh, that tick the attributes that we look for in a company. We want to hold them for as long a time frame as possible until you know, something fundamentally changes about that business and we have to reassess the investment case. That doesn't mean that we are you know firmly stuck in the mud. You know we do have the potential to be more dynamic if an opportunity uh, presents itself either through market conditions or if we see a particular catalyst coming up for a stock or an industry. Yeah, we do have the flexibility to put that forward as a, a shorter term opportunity, and, and that, you know it could be a six month time frame. Uh, but no, our, our starting point is to build a core equity proposition within a client's portfolio that can be held. For many many years, but getting those getting those core companies right uh, is perhaps the, the most important part of what we do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's dig a bit further into Investex Equity Research approach then. And as ever in these interviews, I'm keen to kind of understand what makes it different. If 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 it's different, if it's got an edge maybe versus your peers, perhaps you can characterize the overall approach for us and that might be to say that you focus more on income generating companies for example or or perhaps the opposite of that is there is there a way you can characterize the overall approach for us i think if we had to put ourselves into a stylistic bucket we would call it quality growth yeah mm -hmm. as mentioned we are looking for businesses that stand out within their respective industries as being the global leader um Sometimes, not always, but sometimes those names present themselves within the UK opportunity set. You know, I'd argue that Diageo uh, is probably the world's leading spirit group and happens to be domiciled in the UK. You know, we have a very strong representation in the mining sector. We have an excellent pharmaceutical name in the form of AstraZeneca. Um, but there are other you know, conspicuous sectors in the UK where we don't have global leadership. We're looking for businesses that are leaders uh, in their field. You know, 
we're not particularly focused on income, even though for a lot of our clients, that is still uh, an important requisite. Uh, but we will start looking for companies that offer a strong total return. But there are those sectors that are naturally uh, more income generating, and we will uh, have recommendations within each sector uh, in the market uh, available for our investment managers to create a portfolio yeah. from. But we're looking for... sorry. No, I was going to just interject there. I mean, you mentioned quality and uh, growth as kind of over overarching factors or styles that you're you're aiming for. But is is there more of a top down approach? Would you say do you approach it more from the macro level to then dig into sectors and then beyond that individual equities that that offer those styles, or is it more bottom up and then you you know you you apply those to the macro if you see what I mean? Which way do you come at it? Absolutely. Well, that, our investment process marries up both of those approaches. Mm. Uh, but it, our role as direct equity analysts is very much from that bottom-up uh, perspective. So, you know, between the, the 10 of us, we, we divide up the major uh, global sectors and we have responsibility for uh, a couple of those each. And we are then tasked with finding the best possible names we can find within those sectors. When it comes to how we combine uh, those companies that we identify as being best in class to create a, a portfolio for clients, uh, that's the point at which the top-down perspective will start to be brought uh, into account. And that is set higher up by our asset allocation committee. So we serve up the raw ingredients, if you like, that could be used to construct a diversified equity portfolio. How those ingredients are combined uh, into the final recipe, the final meal, uh, is in part driven by our view of the world from a macro perspective. Yeah, great. And um, at Opto, uh, in our daily coverage, the articles that we put out on a on a daily basis on the website tend to follow a, a thematic approach. We try to talk about longer term, even secular growth trends uh, that we can analyze and identify for our readers, and then they can dig into the investable opportunities within those themes. And it's a bit of a tangent, but hopefully you'll indulge me. I just wondered to what extent do Investec actually apply a similar thematic approach if they do at all? Bearing in mind that obviously you did say it was it was bottom up to begin with anyway. No, it's it's a perfectly good question, Hayden. And I think we're in a fortunate position really that we can incorporate thematic investments into our client portfolios in one of two ways. Uh, one and more straightforward way is through identifying excellent third party fund managers who do this thematic investing for a living. You know, there are plenty of well established sector specialist funds out there that we know well. Uh, but there are also funds that pursue a more specific theme. Um, you know, the houses such as Picte or Rubico are very well established in that field. And again, mm. uh, my colleagues who focus on uh, collective research uh, will be uh, fully aware of the opportunity set that's out there from a thematic fund point of view. And those two will be available to our clients uh, for whom it is deemed appropriate. And, and that approach is particularly useful uh, if the theme is one where there are relatively few direct, direct large capitalized company opportunities to invest in, or the key companies in that theme are based in geographies uh, that we don't currently uh, have direct equity research in, such as China or Japan. Uh, but alternatively, you know, where a theme does offer abundant direct opportunities to invest in large cap names in developed markets, then we are quite capable of investing directly. Uh, one example there would be the energy transition uh, theme, where we can invest through the whole value chain of energy transition uh, from upstream uh, commodity and metal producers to manufacturers, uh, such as Vestas or Solar Edge or Series Power, uh, all the way through to downstream renewable operators uh, like the UK's uh, SSE uh, or the Iberian business EDPR. So we can approach it in one of two ways. But no, we are certainly alert to the uh, interest and opportunities that uh, some of the current thematic investments uh, offer. Fantastic. All right. Well, let's take it back to the individual stocks then. You mentioned that growth, uh, that quality growth style. Um, how do you identify a quality growth business? What characteristics make up those businesses? There are four characteristics or attributes that we would like to see uh, in our best in class equity selection. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of Warren Buffett esque. Uh, common sense that we apply to our investment process. So this is, you know, it's not black box. It's not algorithm driven. It is based on a solid, uh, well-established 
investing fundamentals. So firstly, we want high quality companies. Our definition of that, uh, those companies with a distinct competitive advantage or in Warren Buffett's terms, an economic moat. Uh, We also want those businesses to have a, a balance sheet that is appropriate uh, for its industry. So that's the, the quality side of things. Uh, we want businesses that are value creating. So that's a business that is growing, has the opportunity to reinvest in itself, but importantly, that earns a positive return ahead of its cost of capital on every pound or dollar or euro that it's investing. You know, if your returns are less than your cost of capital, you really should stop investing. Uh, each incremental uh, pound that you invest is is not going to give you any incremental returns. So they must be high quality, value creating, uh, and we look for a strong management team. And within that, we're looking for for managers who demonstrate you know, high levels of integrity, uh, management teams that can make very uh, convincing and consistent capital allocation decisions, but also management teams that are focused on the long term. You know, we don't want any myopic focus on achieving quarter by quarter earnings. Uh, as mentioned earlier, our time horizon is much longer than that. Uh, and finally, we want them at a fair price. You know, we accept we're not always going to get these type of companies at bargain basement prices. You know, and surprisingly, mm. a lot of investors are looking for exactly these kind of attributes. Uh, and we don't mind paying a fair price for a company. We must be alert, though, to the danger uh, of overpaying for some of these companies, as perhaps was a risk uh, over the last uh, 12 months or so. Uh, as the market became very fixated on on growth uh, at any price. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned sustainability earlier. You're obviously alert to the fact that that's something that's uh, sort of front of mind for a lot of your investors. Uh, How do you apply that kind of ESG layer to your equity research approach? What goes into that? First of all, when it comes to this whole field of responsible investing and sustainability, you know, we are not making any decisions as to what is acceptable or not uh, from an ethical point of view for a client's portfolio. Uh, so we are not making any uh, sector-based exclusions to our coverage universe. You know, we have discretion of our client's money, uh, but it is still their money and it is up to the client uh, to direct us if they have any specific uh, exclusionary factors that they would like us to accommodate, which we can quite readily. Uh, but on the basis that we start with a clean sheet of paper, uh, our first move from an ESG perspective is really one of good hygiene. Uh, that is screening out those companies in a particular industry that pose the greatest risk of destroying the shareholder value uh, by not properly managing their ESG responsibilities. And we get a perspective on that, both from our own analysis, speaking with the companies, looking through their sustainability reports. Uh, but we also use the services of a third-party uh, specialist analysis company. Uh, to opine on a company's ESG credentials. But we can go further than that. And that is, as I say, simply hygiene. We also have tools and research at our disposal uh, that allow investment managers to construct portfolios that are actively skewed uh, to achieving a particular positive outcome. Uh, That might be, for example, uh, alignment of a portfolio with one or more of the UN's sustainable development goals. Fantastic. Well, now we've got a kind of firmer idea of Investex equity research approach. Let's use that as a lens through which to look at current markets uh, with a focus on UK equities, like we mentioned earlier. Um, You know, in regards to UK equity performance, as we briefly discussed, it's been relatively positive in comparison to US and Asia markets in particular. But from a valuation perspective, we talked about getting a fair price for the companies that you're looking at. Can we go as far as saying, UK stocks are cheap now. Are they getting cheaper? Where, where do you have them on, on that valuation scale, as it were? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I guess we have to be careful a little bit to make the, the distinction between cheap and good mm. value. Uh, certainly, UK companies look very lowly rated, uh, even relative to their historic discounts. When you look at conventional metrics, say, compared to the US. Uh, but that, of course, is not the whole story. You know, alongside the headline valuation that you're being asked to pay for a stock or an index, uh, one also needs to consider the quality of the companies in that index and the sectoral split. Uh, for example, you might look at the return on equity of a market and see how that compares to the price that you're being asked to pay for the companies they're in. You've also got to look at the long-term growth potential as well. So when you take those kind of considerations into account, um, alongside simply the headline valuation, then the scales are not quite so weighted in the UK's favour. Uh, but we can't deny that there are certain pockets of value and opportunity uh, within the UK market that do look uh, very conspicuously cheap. 
We hope you're enjoying the episode. For interviews like this every Thursday, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, make sure you give us a star rating and leave guest suggestions along with any other feedback in the review section. Now, back to the show. Um, the FTSE 100 is often described as one perhaps better fundamentally set up to outperform in current market environments, in, in market environments that are similar to the one that we're in now relative to, you know, the S&P 500, for example, which is a lot more tech and growth oriented. Uh, firstly, would you share that view that now relative to the US, it might be a better time to skew your exposure towards FTSE 100 companies versus their US counterparts? That has certainly been the experience um, year to date as we've seen perhaps some of the exuberance come out of the uh, valuations that were in place for some U.S. companies, particularly tech and particularly profitable uh, technology names in the U.S., which really have uh, sold off very aggressively. So, yes, certainly from that perspective, you know, the U.K. FTSE 200 is well positioned at the moment. Uh, you know, the two sectors, uh, as mentioned, that comprise nearly 20% of the UK market, the oil majors and the miners between them are both enjoying very strong uh, conditions at the moment as a consequence of uh, high commodity prices. And beyond that, you have uh, those dependable, you might think of them as slightly boring uh, industries in the UK that are also you know, significant contributors to the index, uh, tobacco being a prime example there that has performed uh, relatively very well uh, so far this year. But other names, you know, Diageo, the, the spirits major, a significant part of the UK market performing very well, uh, benefiting from uh, easing COVID restrictions and uh, resumed uh, on-trade consumption of its spirits. Uh, and also names like AstraZeneca, you know, trading very near all-time highs and one of the major constituents of the UK market. So yes, perhaps through more through good fortune than good design, but the UK market certainly appears uh, to be in the, in the right areas at the moment uh, for investors to... Uh, find a little bit more shelter during these times of uncertain market conditions. Yeah, understood. Okay, well, do you think it would be fair to say then on that basis that it might be time to start shunning the more cyclical sectors, the more cyclical areas of the market, you know, the hyper growth stocks or just even growth oriented businesses in favor of these non-cyclical sectors and the sectors that you mentioned earlier, you know, energy, commodities, those sorts of sectors? Is it fair to say there should be more of a bias towards the defensive areas of the market, do you think? Looking in the rearview mirror, I would say yes. Uh, looking forward from here, I, I think the case is more mixed, L larger because the, the sell-off that we have seen uh, in the growth names has been so aggressive. I wouldn't go as far to say it's been indiscriminate. Uh, certainly those companies that promised most and have delivered least uh, have been hardest hit. Uh, but even companies that we still view as very attractive long-term growth opportunities that meet all of those uh, characteristics that we discussed earlier you know, are now being offered at much uh, more uh, appealing valuations. Mm. So, no, I don't think it's the time, or I think the time has passed, perhaps, if you were tactical, to turn one's back completely on, on some of those high-growth names. In terms of where you're positioned on the on the cyclical names, whether that's commodity plays, uh, whether that's some of the financial sector, you know, we still see quite a lot to go for, particularly in miners, where we think there is a long-term structural growth story driven uh, in a large degree by the energy transition, which will just mean you know, significant incremental demand for base commodities going forwards. But you know, in the financial space, in the banking sector, uh, we finally got to a point where the banks can start to earn uh, a more positive spread uh, between the uh, borrowing and lending rates. So the net interest margin for the banks is finally starting to rebuild again as interest rates start to go up. And so you know, names like HSBC uh, in the UK should be well positioned uh, to start to benefit from that tightening rate cycle over the next 12 months. So now I don't think it's time to completely shun uh, as ever you have to be selective but the time to exit wholesale uh, has probably passed. Yeah, great. Really interesting. Well, if we look at the same question, I suppose, but from an income-seeking investor, um, do, do UK domiciled investors seeking dividend returns have reason to be optimistic in the current climate? So same question, but from that income generation perspective. 
I think so, absolutely. Yeah, you know, looking at the the heavyweight contributors to that near four percent running dividend yield uh, on the FTSE all share, the big names are the oil companies, the mining companies, the tobacco sector, individual names like HSBC and AstraZeneca, and we see no reason uh, why the sustainability uh, of dividends from those companies uh, shouldn't be uh, fairly secure over the next. 18 months at least. Yes, you may get some you know, special dividends, which are a consequence of those super normal profits that we're seeing, particularly in the oil majors at the moment. And it seems unrealistic to think that they can be recurring year on year items. At some point, we'd expect the oil price to normalize and the profitability of the oil majors uh, to normalize as well. But for now, uh, the music is playing. Uh, ordinary dividends look well supported. Special dividends look more than likely. Uh, so for income seeking uh, investors, there is plenty to choose from in the UK market uh, to build a very healthy uh, running yield on a portfolio. Yeah, interesting. And and just building on that, then it did strike me, I suppose, when I looked at the FTSE 100 and just the larger UK companies in general, you know, the fundamental makeup of those businesses tends to be a mix of typically long lived businesses, more mature industries as well, uh, particularly amongst those largest companies, as I say, does that leave dividend seeking investors in the UK with more options than perhaps they would have elsewhere around the world? Absolutely. I'd say they're they're spoiled um, (laughs) relative, certainly to the US market, but even relative to the European market as well. Yeah, the mix of sectors that we have in the UK uh, and the uh, companies we have therein, you know, naturally is skewed towards income. And you're right, within those sectors, you know, we tend to have mature businesses. In many cases, these will be businesses that are generating more cash flow than they need or could reinvest in a particular year. Uh, The balance sheets are in good order, so paying down debt doesn't have to be a priority. Uh, So therefore, absent of any other uh, uses for that capital and then returns to shareholders from these mature businesses, uh, looks likely to continue. Fantastic. And to finish, I suppose, I've got a couple of questions on this, but I I like to finish, I suppose, by looking ahead, uh, still within the UK space. But uh, if we have a look at earnings. I mean, earnings season is back in full flow. It never seems to end. It seems sort of eternally or perpetually going. And I'm sure you feel that as well, uh, having to cover all these businesses. But um, are there any, and I, I'm, I'm not sure whether you can talk individual stocks, but if you can't, sectors or just spaces within the market, are there any that have particularly surprised you in how positive or negative their earnings have been? I'd say so far, we're fairly early in the season, um, so there hasn't been too much opportunity for surprise, uh, particularly on the upside. I think going into the season, uh, investors would have been firmly braced uh, for more risk of downside disappointment than upside. Yeah, the, we know that there are a confluence of factors that are, are facing corporates that have the potential to weigh on profitability, whether that's slowing economic growth, whether that's increasing input costs uh, from raw materials to uh, wage inflation. Uh, we expect there to be uh, a little bit of, of pressure being felt uh, by corporates generally as we go through this season. But so far, we haven't had anything that has been too shocking, at least not in the companies that we are uh, focused on. Uh, and for some of those you know, traditional staple businesses, you know, Coca-Cola reporting yesterday a very solid set of numbers. Yes, a little bit of uh, margin pressure on on the raw ingredients that go into Coca-Cola. But you know, if you're looking for a company that has the the pricing power and the longevity uh, behind it to cope with those kind of pressures, uh, then that's the kind of uh, name that you would be looking for. And the shares are are, are behaving very well. But I'm sure there will be some uh, clangers that emerge uh, from the earnings season going forwards, and particularly amongst those companies who are still trading on the fullest multiples. Market expectations in some cases are still very high. The US market as a whole is still trading on a, a price to earnings multiple of you know, the high teens. Uh, you know, that, that isn't priced for disappointment. That is still priced in many instances for good execution. And inevitably, there will be some companies uh, that will disappoint. I'd have to highlight Netflix uh, from last mm-hmm. week, not one that we are mercifully uh, invested in, but just an example of what the market reaction uh, can be 
uh, to, to corporate earnings and news flow and guidance uh, that disappoints. Yeah, absolutely. And just to dig into your coverage and your analysis of companies around earnings time, um, do you identify important or key metrics for each company that you're covering prior to their earning announcement that you you kind of most look out for, I suppose, that you're you're keen to kind of dig into more so than, you know, companies release a, a hell of a lot of information to to investors, but is there specific indicators that you're looking for for each company and do you identify them before their announcement? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, there are uh, metrics, there are numbers, there are ratios that are more pertinent to some industries than others uh, and we will certainly be focused on that, whether it's like-for-like -like sales in retailers, whether it's organic growth in consumer staples businesses, whether it's net interest margin in banks. Um, we know what the key um, touch points will be for investors. We have good insight into what the market is expecting in the way of a consensus. Quite often that consensus is compiled uh, and provided by the company themselves. So yes, we can be fairly confident going into a set of results that we know what the you know, half a dozen uh, key factors are that the market will be focusing on. Uh, and quite quickly, you can get a feel for the overall tone and likely market reaction to a set of results from from how a company has delivered uh, against those key uh, key factors yeah fantastic well let's finish then for your kind of outlook for the for the FTSE 100 in terms of performance now we could obviously avoid definitive forecasts of course but can you just give us a broad sense of whether you think investors exposed to the FTSE 100 should be looking up or down for the rest of 2022 if we can start there Oh, well, that's a that's a tough. I question. mean, given that it's um, broadly flat at the moment, year to date, I think we're down zero point nine percent at the moment. Yes, in absolute terms, if I was a betting man, I would be looking for and satisfied if we got a, a, a modestly positive return from the FTSE hundred over the course of this year uh, on a total return uh, basis. So, given you're starting with a, a dividend yield not far four percent, that doesn't imply mm. too much in the way of expectations for capital growth but you know for the reasons that we've discussed uh, already you know the uk does find itself temporarily at least perhaps better positioned than some of its international peers uh, to weather if not necessarily make hay uh, during this uh, uncertain market period so i'd be yeah modestly optimistic over a positive but not spectacular return uh, for the uk on a total return basis uh, this year. Fantastic. All right. A nice message to end the uh, main body of the podcast on then. Um, <laughs> we've got a quick fire question round now. So this, this shouldn't take too long, but it's a more generic list of questions. We ask the same question to all of our guests and just a lighthearted way to end the episode. Uh, feel free to answer in as little as one sentence or even one word if you like. The first question is what is the most frequent mistake made by investors, do you think? One around timing, either selling too soon uh, if something looks up with events or, or fully valued you know, on the assumption that you can buy what is hopefully a high quality business back more attractive levels in the future. Uh, so often uh, that has proved not to be the case. The, easy, the selling is the easy part. You know, if you try and find the opportunity to buy it back meaningfully cheaper, so often that opportunity never presents itself and you see the share price continue to run away and you think, hell. Why did I sell that in the first place? Uh, so, yeah, basically it boils down to the selling your winners and running your losers kind of adage. You know, the asymmetry of that, or sorry, the symmetry of that is the um, uh, holding on to your underperformance too long. Yeah. Yeah, a good sell discipline is very important to a successful investor. Yeah, incredibly important. Okay, question two then. Where do you go for investment or economic insights? Do you read any specific publishers, for example? Uh, no, uh, we, or I... Uh, as part of Investec, enjoy access to a broad range of inputs. We have several specialist economic research houses uh, on our list, um, but we also have access to broad uh, sell-side research as well, which incorporates uh, macro and economic uh, thought pieces. So no, no particular publication. Uh, my colleagues who work in strategy may have uh, a more focused shortlist. You know, I, I enjoy the, the the variety and the the range of thoughts provided by the, the breadth of uh, third-party inputs that we have. Great. Question three. Um, now, this can be a tricky one, but if, if, if there is a moment from within your career to date that particularly sticks in your mind, doesn't necessarily need to be positive, it could be negative, it could be anything that just comes front of centre when I ask you the question, what is the most memorable moment from your career to date, do you think? 
Hmm, I, yeah, I'd struggle to, to narrow it down to one specific instance. But what I would highlight, uh, I think, and it's less to do with me and more to do with uh, my colleagues uh, and the business, is, is how our business performed uh, through 2020 uh, in the early part uh, of the COVID crisis. Mm. The resilience of our portfolios, which were really you know, stress-tested in volatile market conditions, uh, and the response of our business um, from research through investment managers through our operations team um, to that unfolding um, crisis. I think that's probably the thing that springs to mind, uh, certainly in in, in recent history, uh, has been a notable uh, win. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Our penultimate question then is, if you could go back in time, what one bit of advice would you give your younger self? Um, I think it is understanding that whilst it is important to have conviction in your recommendations, uh, it's equally as important to be willing to accept that you've got it wrong. Uh, I think something that all analysts do from time to time, uh, and perhaps junior analysts are are more uh, exposed to this risk, is making a recommendation and then blindly defending it, even if Everything mm. subsequently you know, suggests that you've got the recommendation wrong. Um, I think early in your career, it's quite hard to accept that as you get older and accumulate more gray hairs. You, know, you accept more readily that you know, you, you, we are going to get some things wrong. You know, we don't have a 100% strike rate. But I, I think recognizing and accepting when a, uh, an investment decision hasn't worked uh, and being prepared to change one's stance is probably one of the harder lessons, uh, but one of the more imp- important lessons uh, for anybody starting out in our industry. Yeah, absolutely. And one we've heard before, so you're certainly not alone in that. Um, question five then, this is our final question. And I suppose the OPSO question, as it were, we aim to speak to the fund managers, the analysts, the investors generally that are outperforming benchmark returns or at least doing something different to their peers. So we ask all of them, what is an investor's best source of alpha? So if you had to narrow it down to one thing, where do you think the great investors derive their outperformance? I I think it's a confluence of having conviction uh, in the ideas and in their investment positions, but also staying invested, tying back to that earlier point of of selling too soon. Uh, So probably the single biggest source is is the time that you are invested in the market. Uh, It's so easy to destroy shareholder or client value uh, by trying to be too clever and too dynamic. Yeah. Okay, great. Fantastic. Um, Well, I think that brings us to the end of the podcast. So it just leaves me to say thank you very much for joining us on the show, Guy. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening, everyone. Just a quick note before we sign off. If you're looking for an easily digestible daily update on the markets, this might be of interest. Opto Updates is our short newsletter sent every day during the trading week, giving you a bulleted list of the top seven stories from the global stock markets. We've done the hard work for you, highlighting relevant opportunities and trends. And in addition, we'll also keep you notified of any new products, stock reports, or webinars from the Opto world. If you're interested, sign up using the link in the show notes. And thanks also to CoFruition for consulting on and producing the show. Until next time. Go fruition.